Hello, my name is Mike Scott, and I'm speaking to you from Philadelphia in the USA. Thank you for asking me to speak at the Congress. I'm going to talk to you about the role of regional anesthesia for enhanced recovery after abdominal surgery. My relevant disclosures are the fact that I'm on the ERAS Society Executive Committee and President of ERAS USA. So I want to discuss the goal of functional analgesia for abdominal surgery and the ERAS approach using opioid reduction with a multimodal approach addressing both visceral and abdominal wall pain and touch on the regional analgesia techniques of thoracic epidural, spinal opioids and truncal blocks. You're all familiar with ERAS pathways and they stretch from both pre, peri and post-op the idea of optimizing your patient, reducing injury, and then protocolized de-escalation. And multimodal opioid sparing analgesia is key for this, and it spreads right the way across all parts of the pathway, including post-discharge. However, also important is counseling and education of your patient. In 2017, I co-chaired the Perioperative Quality Initiative Joint Consensus Statement on optimal analgesia with an enhanced recovery pathway with Matt McAvoy from Vanderbilt. And we tried to get away from this idea of pain as a pain score, more towards optimized patient comfort with fastest functional recovery and fewer side effects. We designed a treatment algorithm for achieving optimal analgesia right from preoperative to home the mandatory principle that patients needed to have realistic expectation setting and education about analgesia and what to expect. The backbone for this, of course, is multimodal analgesia using non steroidal anti inflammatories, acetaminophen or paracetamol, gabapentinoids if appropriate, and then a single shot or catheter based local anesthetic technique. Other adjuncts such as ketamine and dexmetadomidine can be used. But you also need a rescue plan for suboptimal analgesia, which doesn't rely on intravenous opioids. So optimal analgesia, according to patient type and surgery, is really important to restore function and reduce the stress response. At the same time, you want to minimize opiates and reduce all drug doses according to age and GFR. You're all aware of the terrible opioid epidemic in the USA that we've got. And this paper in the JAMA surgery by Brummett showed that basically between 5.9 and 6.5% of patients undergoing surgery had persistent opioid use after. And it didn't matter whether it was minor or major surgery. And this meant that they developed tolerance. And the take-home opioid prescriptions are also a key cause of new addiction uh, by diversion for the young people in our communities. So it's absolutely vital that we reduce perioperative opioids and take home opioid medications. I'm very proud to be involved in this international multidisciplinary consensus statement on the prevention of opioid related harm in adult surgical patients. And I urge you to look this up. It's got some fantastic uh, infographics on modifiable risk factors for opioids and as well as that functional recovery. The key regional techniques I'm going to talk about are TEA, thoracic epidural analgesia, spinal opiates, and then transabdominus plane or TAP blocks, quadratus lumborum blocks, and erectus spiny plane blocks. But with all of these, it's important that you look at both the abdominal wall pain and the visceral pain. And this depends on the type of surgery and organ that's been operated on, and also whether it's minimally invasive or open surgery. And so you've got to think about which of these is important to address the different types of pain and what and the duration of that pain? Other key factors to consider are the availability and training in ultrasound, because we know that this improves efficacy and safety of abdominal wall blocks. It can also mean that you can raise a pocket, which I think increases the duration of analgesia. And there's other options like liposomal bupivacaine. However, there's also patient factors that affect what we do. Preoperative opioid tolerance complicates acute pain strategies. If a patient's got renal dysfunction or uh, the surgery, there's a risk of bleeding, you may need to avoid or delay the use of non-steroidals. 
And then if you've got an old or frail patient, gabapentinoids might not be the best thing to use, the risk of falls. And anticoagulation can be an issue if you're putting in a needle anywhere and also if you're using catheter-based techniques. And finally, although refusal of regional anesthesia is rare, um, it is important. Now, I think thoracic epidural anesthesia has been so well studied now, we, we all really know where we are with it. Um, and this is the latest Cochrane database review, which really does outline what I think we all feel, that, that we know it reduces the stress response. You get improved respiratory function and less pain on coughing. It can improve cardiac protection. And when it's good, it's really very, very good. But unfortunately, efficacy can vary throughout the post-operative period. Low-dose local anesthesia and opioids are probably the best combination, and PCEA may also offer improved efficacy. We also know with the UK NAP3 audit that it's a very safe technique, and the risk-benefit uh, ratio normally favours the use of epidural anesthesia. But even then, there's still the risk of hypotension, and anticoagulation can be an issue, putting the catheter in and taking it out. One thing a few years ago was postulated is that epidurals improve cancer survival, but I think that's now been dispelled. This uh, paper in 2021 by Folks Group is, looks at the Swedish colorectal cancer registry with over 5,700 patients, and they showed no difference between 30-day, 90-day, and three-year mortality um, with or without epidural, whether it be open or minimally invasive surgery. And this really mirrored what we found in our own institute back in Guildford, where we published this paper in the BJA, where we found that there is no significant advantage to be gained in overall or disease-free survival with the use of regional analgesia as compared to opioid analgesia. Now, spinal anesthesia is proving to be very popular now with the increased amount of robotic and laparoscopic surgery. And... When you combine it with an opioid, you have many benefits because it gives you improved pain control in the PACU, and also it has an opioid sparing effect. As well as that, you've got a good safety profile and low failure rate as compared with epidural anesthesia. And as long as you use low dosing of volumes and also low dosing of the opioid, whether that be duramorph or diamorphine, you can reduce your downstream side effects. So overall, it's short acting and the motor effect wears off within a few hours, allowing the ability for the patient to mobilize quickly, which is one of the aims of enhanced recovery after surgery. And the use of presses is not there and you can normally not need to continue intravenous fluids. So all in all, it's a good option. This was a landmark paper we published in 2011 which compared epidural analgesia with spinal and, and morphine in an RCT. And we found really that, that all groups did well, but epidural analgesia actually did delay discharge. And I think this is a sign that basically with laparoscopic surgery, visceral pain is actually well held at about 24 hours with oral adjuncts. Um, and because your wound is often a lot smaller and any transverse incision, if it's subumbilical, means that the patient can mobilize without the need for an epidural. Now, tap blocks I consider now as part of mainstream anesthesia practice. And this was one of the first big meta-analyses back in 2014, which showed benefit in early and late pain at rest. There was then a further meta-analysis looking at ultrasound-guided tap blocks, which really just showed increased efficacy. But one thing I thought was important is that there was no benefit shown of a tap block if you'd already used spinal opiates. Now, quadratus lumborum blocks were first discovered and uh, described by Raphael Blanco. There's different approaches, and they're still not yet in mainstream practice, but they are efficacious, they're opioid sparing, and there's a good side effect profile, and data is uh, emerging all the time. And in fact, this is a, another meta-analysis from 2020 showing that actually QL blocks um, were actually superior to TAP blocks in reducing morphine and fentanyl consumption in abdominal surgery. Now, erector spiny plane blocks have had huge attention in the last three years, 
But because of the location, there's more publications on, on cardiac, breast, and thoracic rather than abdominal, but they can be used in abdominal surgery. However, the mechanism of action is still unclear and re reproducibility because of the spread. And I really like this paper by Schwarzman's group in the Canadian Journal last year, looking at MRI imaging of local anesthetic spread. And really what they did show was the extent of spread of injectate in the neural foramina and intercostal and epidural spaces varied, um, as, as did uh, the dermatomal spread. Finally, I threw in this slide, which is basically our own meta-analysis on the effect of lidocaine on elective colorectal surgery. And basically, in laparoscopic surgery, lidocaine improves time to tolerance of diet, reduces post-optive morphine requirement and length of stay. So it's a good thing to consider in laparoscopic surgery. Finally, how do you implement all this? Well, this is what we did at my last health system in Virginia. We got the surgical and anesthesia teams together. We, we built a structured pathway for each of the different types of surgical procedures. And you can see that we chose some form of local anesthetic block, be it single shot or catheter based, uh, for each of the different types of pathways. And then if you went from uh, laparoscopic to open, we had a bailout plan. And then also a, um, a map of post-optive uh, plan for use of other drugs such as non steroidals and gabapentinoids and whether they're appropriate or contraindicated. So in summary, thoracic epidural analgesia has no benefit in laparoscopic surgery and long-term survival benefit signal is low. I think that, that we can uh, cast that aside now. PCEA using low-dose local anesthetic and low-dose opioids I think is the optimal way of offering great analgesia in open surgery, but there's still problems with efficacy. There's still the risk of hypotension and caution with anticoagulation. Spinal opioids reduce opioid requirements in laparoscopic surgery, and TAP and QL blocks all reduce opioid requirements and are safe. ESP blocks are still in evolution, and lidocaine infusions can improve 24 outcomes in colorectal surgery and are probably transferable into other types of abdominal surgery. So, in conclusion, regional anesthesia is key to achieve opioid sparing analgesia and ERAS pathways in combination with oral multimodal analgesia. Opioid reduction is key to downstream use and avoiding addiction. There are many regional techniques that are effective. But it's very important that we have a hospital system where you've got analgesia plans which are individualized for the surgery and the surgical approach, individualized for the patient factors that I talked about, and also utilize regional blocks that can be delivered both efficaciously and safely in the hospital. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to taking questions.